Nancy Pelosi has represented San Francisco in the House of Representatives since 1987. And she served as the 60th Speaker of the House from 2007 to 2011. It was the only woman to have held that position, uh, making her the highest woman elected in politics in history at that time. And since then, she served as the Democratic leader. <laughs> but for Nancy Pelosi, public service is a family tradition. Her dad uh, was a United States representative from Maryland's third congressional district and subsequently served as mayor of Baltimore. Uh, her brother also served as mayor of Baltimore. As Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi led what uh, congressional scholar Norman Ornstein called one of the most productive Congresses in history. And perhaps most notably, uh, she spearheaded the passage of the health care reform legislation uh, that established the Patients' Bill of Rights <laughs> and extended health care insurance to 30 million people who were formerly uninsured in this country, something that is very, very important to me personally, uh, having spent uh, a good part of my own career taking care of many of those people and seeing the consequences of the lack of adequate health care in their daily lives that led them to be over consumers from a financial point of view when the situation really became critical and they wound up in our emergency departments. But there's another side here to Leader Pelosi, and that is that she is an incredibly strong advocate for higher education. She oversaw the passage of a major new investment in federal student aid, including the largest expansion of the GI Bill since its creation. And more importantly, or equally as importantly to people here at Rutgers, uh, the Student Aid and Fiscal Responsibility Act, which boosted Pell Grants, and restructured the federal student load program. So important to our students, given the fact that so many of our students here um, are recipients of Pell Grants, and so many of our students here are, in fact, the first in their family uh, to be at a university, and we're proud of that fact. Among her other contributions, uh, Leader Pelosi has championed investments in clean energy and in uh, initiatives for veterans, uh, development of HIV vaccine, and initiatives to assist people who are living with AIDS. In 2008, she released a book entitled Know Your Power, A Message to America's Daughters, which I know that both of our children have read. And last fall, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls. And you all remember the Seneca Falls Convention and what came out of there. Nancy Pelosi is an inspiring leader and a role model for our students, and that's one of the points that we need to make here, a role model. This is how someone can really influence the world as well as the country and the state and the family and how it can be done and still come and have the humility uh, and the um, approachability to interact with our students uh, in, a, in a venue like this. And I'm really looking forward to having Debbie Walsh here, who's the director of the Center for American Women in Politics uh, leading this conversation. So without any further ado, um, join me in welcoming Debbie and House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi to the podium. Thank you. first standing ovation. <laughs> Thank you so much, President Barchi and Leader Pelosi. It is such an honor for the Center for American Women and Politics and for me personally to welcome you, you after spending more than 30 years at COP, to have the highest ranking elected woman in the history of the United States mm -hmm. here. It is mm -hmm.
So I want to make the most of our time. We are we're going to be very conscious of your schedule, and I'm just going to jump right in, and we'll start our conversation. Um, our research has shown over and over again that women in public leadership make a difference. They change the policy agenda. They change the way policy is shaped. And as you well know, they change the way government works. Never before has a woman reached the level of leadership that you have um, as the leader of your party in Congress and then as the speaker. And as was said before, widely acclaimed as the most effective speaker in recent history. What I would hope that you could share with us today is a little bit about the difference that you have seen women making serving in Congress, you yourself personally, but also your colleagues in Congress. Well, thank you very much, Debbie, for that opening question, which leads me to brag on my colleagues in Congress and women in politics in general. I really was very honored to receive your invitation to be here. I have admired your work for such a long time. You've been such a strong voice, and the center has been such a force uh, for enabling women, empowering women uh, to have the confidence to go out there and, and run for public office or help others do so, but to be involved. Uh, thank, I thank President Barshi for his kind words of introduction. I, what he didn't say is my father and my brother were mayors of Baltimore. Thomas D'Alessandro, Jr., and the third. So I'm the first Italian-American speaker of the house, as well as first woman. <laughs> and all these generational things. I've met Ruth Mandel's grandson, and now I know he's in high school. Ruth, thank you for your tremendous, tremendous leadership as a founding director and, and the role that you play. Uh, Jackie Litt. Uh, where's Jackie, thank you also for your leadership. So all of these women understanding, know inside, knowing inside of them what will happen if we unleash uh, the power of women. So I also want to say that I wouldn't have been speaker without some enlightened men who voted for me for that job. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was Rush Holt, who was one of my earliest supporters. <laughs> She has been a tremendous blessing to the Congress and to the country. Again, I know the bumper sticker, my member of Congress is a rocket scientist. <laughs> but he has made a, 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 such a tremendous difference, so proud of his district. And I was always proud each year to swear him in. Whether I was speaker or not, that was the way we did it. And I love him. And, and Donald Payne Jr. was with us earlier uh, this, uh, this morning as well. And I had the privilege of serving with his father who has been recognized globally as a tremendous leader. I mean, you probably wouldn't think that if you went to the St. Patrick's Day dinner in Washington, the American Ireland Fund, that a picture as big as the back, the whole wall, would be of Donald Payne for his work that he did in Ireland. But not only that, in, in all over the world, and of course, received uh, as a leader in the whole continent of Africa, no one knew more than he did. But Donald Payne Jr. is making his own mark, and we're very, very proud of him. So I'm honored that the two of them have joined us uh, for a spell here this morning. And I thank all of you. So we're going to talk about uh, the difference that women make in some specific cases. Sometimes I have to explain to people that the speaker, it's the president, the vice president, the speaker of the house. It's the third highest position in our country. The first. High, uh, the highest position in the legislative branch. In the Constitution, the legislative branch is the first Article I. And so it's a, a very powerful position. And I think people are learning more about how powerful it is by, shall we say, <laughs> default, <laughs> about things, things not getting done as to when they did get done. But I was very proud to have that honor to serve in that position uh, I always thought it would be easier to elect a woman president because the public was so much farther ahead of the, of the, than the Congress in terms of recognizing uh, that. Uh, but the, my colleagues, God bless them, honored the tradition of our country of opportunity and equality and elected a woman speaker. And once you have the gavel, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> <laughs> So why is this important, and, and why do I salute the center? Over and over again, every time I see you quote, quoted, I'm so proud, and I hear of your work, 
and I know that many members of the state legislature in New Jersey uh, have come through the program. The, I truly believe, and I say this to the young men and women who are here, that having more women involved in the political process and in government is the most wholesome thing that we can do for our country. When I became a member of Congress, I made it a, a responsibility of my own to try to pull more women into Congress. Uh, uh, Linda Stender, my dear friend, uh, thank you, Linda, for being here. She made a valiant, important run. And, and the, for a couple reasons. Certainly there are issues that women know so well that relate to home and hearth and children and family and health and the rest. But what I'm talking about is women, about our national security, about our, the economy of our country. I'm talking about every aspect of what our responsibilities are to the American people. And it's not just about a, a gender difference. It's about an attitude of consensus building. It's about intuition. It's about use of time. I mean, women have to balance so many things, and they know that if they go to the table, that they have to uh, get the job done. Get the job done. And so, uh, but I do think, and, I, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, Debbie, I do believe that, I've said it was a, a decision that some of us made. When I went, there, there were like um, 12 Democratic women, and now we have 60-some. We've, we've increased by over five times. And that's good, but not good enough. And we want more. And so, what, and, and, and on the Republican side, they had 11, and now they have, um, what, 17 or, you know, still under 20. So we, we have to do more on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the, the, um, and I, I posit this, and I say this, Mr. President, without any fear that I'm, I, this isn't a guarantee. You reduce the role of money in politics, and you increase the level of civility in politics, and you will elect many more women, minorities, young people, to public office. It has to happen. So I'll just start off with that. How do we just kick open the door, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, with all due respect to the incrementalism that we have had, just say, this isn't working for us. This, is, this incremental is not fast enough, not good enough, not worthy enough of our, the greatness of our country. And so, uh, well, you can take some issues very specifically, the Violence Against Women Act. The Violence Against Women Act was something that we passed as part of the crime bill when we passed the gun prohibition on gun, gun safety legislation in the middle 90s. Joe Biden was our all-out champion uh, in the United States Senate as chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Okay, you come forward, a very important, saved lives, Women understood these issues, I think, better than men in terms of what it means at home and the whole, the whole, all, all of it. So we come into this past year, 2013, and, it, and we were long overdue to um, reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. We had tried to do so, and then we lost the Congress, and then it was 600 days overdue almost two full years of the last term. A woman, to your point, on our side, Congresswoman Gwen Moore of Wisconsin, was the out and out total champion. She told her story. She told her story, and it was stunning. And then other women came forward and told their stories. Still, 600 days are going by, and we don't have a reauthorization, so we don't all have the protections and the funding and the rest for initiatives to protect women and men, and men, anyone who has violence against them, but nonetheless the focus, women. Finally, with your help and others, we were able to bring a bill to the floor because we made the issue too hot to handle. Women across America were saying, why are they not passing a bill? Why are they not passing a bill? And here's the way the bill was passed. They brought two bills to the floor. One said, the, the Violence Against Women Act, that Gwen Moore, through her generosity of spirit and telling her story, enabling others to tell theirs, 
They brought that bill, the Glenn Moore's bill. And then they brought another bill that enabled them to vote for that while we voted for this with a few of them. And the bill said, we're against violence against women, except if you're a Native American woman, an immigrant woman, or an LGBT woman. What is that? What is that? What is that? But we prevailed with the comprehensive bill. But that's, you know, that's the kind of education. That's the kind of education that people need. So we have to listen to women. On, on, a Native American woman knows full well the challenges that she faces if somebody not from the tribe comes on to the res It's a longer story, and I'll if you ask me, I'll tell you more. But uh, the, the uh, vulnerability of an, of a, a, an immigrant woman uh, in a situation, of course, LGBT. So in any case, some of these fights that we have are not <coughs> inter-party bickering. They are taking the time to compare something that is important to, to our country. And I was very proud that we, uh, that the president was at, signed the bill with Joe Biden there now as vice president, and having worked very hard on this. But Gwen Moore made all the difference in the world in saying, you can't do this other alternative. You have to do the full bill. There is no question that if we had a recognition, and we're, we're, you know, as you see the work going on with our veterans, our women veterans, but also men, a violence against them in the military, sexual harassment against them, uh, that women took the lead uh, on that issue, and we've made tremendous progress. We're not every place that we want to be yet, but we made a, a, a Kristen Gillibrand in New York, Jackie Spear in California, so many others uh, who took the lead, uh, just saying, no, this has to stop. We have to make change. Uh, but again, the list of women who have taken the lead on issues because they understand because they listen to women. And we believe, the women in Congress believe, that if you had many more women in, in, in the leadership of the Fortune 500, if you had many more women in the leadership of the military, if you had many more women in every aspect of life that you can name, you would have better results. You would have better results. How could it be Fortune 500 and 20 are women? It just can't be that there isn't the talent. We know the talent is there. But we have to unleash the power of women. And I'll, I'll tell you some ideas that I have, but I want to go down your path first. But, uh, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, Mr. President. We're very, very proud of that. Because for one thing, no longer will being a woman be in a pre-existing medical condition. <laughs> Things I, I, I go on too long and have another question. Well, I just want to add one thing about the difference that I think you've made, which is when you look at the Democratic caucus right now in Congress, um, it is a majority women and people of color caucus, and that's your leadership. And well, we're so very proud of that. that. <laughs> women, minorities, LGBT, that's the majority of the House Democratic Caucus. I'm even dazzled by it myself because in the history of the world and parliamentary bodies, it never seen such a phenomenon. And when you see how beautifully diverse, and I always say in my own district, the beauty is in the mix. But it was a decision. It was a decision that we made to make sure we had a path. But we're not satisfied, don't, don't get me wrong. We want even more. But it's not just the numbers in the caucus. Because we're always talking about how do, you, how do you speak to women. Well, we speak to women, but we want women to have a seat at the table. And not only a seat at the table, a seat at the head of the table. So, so in our, um, in our, when I meet on Wednesday mornings with the ranking members, that would be the people who would be chairman should we be in the majority. But our top Democrats on all the committee, the majority of those people are women and minorities as well, and LBGT. The majority of those sitting at the head of the table when they go into their committee uh, meetings. So that, for us, is a source, a source of great pride. Perhaps this might be a moment when, since we're at Rutgers, isn't it a great institution? So proud to be here <laughs> and at the center. 
when I was reading that uh, Rutgers was founded in, correct Mr. President, 1766, one of the original colonial colleges, I was thinking of um, our founders and what they envisioned for our country, and they knew that education was central, central to a successful country and successful families and people. And when I, uh, uh, when I was first elected to the leadership and went for my first meeting, at the White House, and I'm thinking of Rutgers in this regard because of Florence Eagleton later, you know, over time and the role that she played in what we're doing here today, the suffragettes. Uh, when I went to my first meeting, I walked in, and I, I, fr frankly, I wasn't intimidated about going to this meeting. It was at the White House with President Bush and the Democratic and Republican leaders in the House and Senate. I wasn't, because I've been to the White House many times, an appropriator, intelligence, whatever, until I walked into the room and the door closed behind me, and I realized that this was like unlike any other meeting that I had ever been at the White House. In fact, it was unlike any meeting that any woman had ever been to at the White House. Because there we were at the table, just as I described who they were, and I was there not as an appointee of the president, however excellent that might be, but speaker, not yet the speaker, but a leader of my party there not by his appointment, but as a voice of a whole different constituency. And as he was gracious, and President Bush ever gracious, welcomed me and all this, I'm on my chair, and I'm feeling very, very closed in. It was as if, I mean, I was just packed and jammed on that chair. And, I, and he must have been wondering what I was doing, because I was <laughs> like this. And uh, I thought, what is going on here? And then all of a sudden, I realized that on that chair with me was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, Alice Paul, you name it. Uh, you, every, they were all there on that chair. And I could hear them say, at last we have a seat at the table. Did I say Susan B. Anthony? She was probably, she was there too. And probably Florence Eagleton. But here's the thing. Immediately I thought, we want more. Because I, I looked around and saw I was the only diversity there. We want more. And we have to have more. Not just in numbers, and, but in, in leadership and the rest. And that's really important to the American people to see. People who may have shared their challenges understand their aspirations. But also, uh, what I realized, which I knew, but I drove home at that moment, was that uh, I was standing on their shoulders. They fought so hard for women to get the right to vote. And you young people, we all invite you, the women in Congress, <coughs> to stand on our shoulders. We have that responsibility to the future. But just as they did something drastic, and by the way, when women got the right to vote, they, the headline said, women given the right to vote. <laughs> given? I don't think so. <laughs> Fought, struggled, marched, starved, were starved, every possible thing, even rejected in their own homes for speaking up and the rest. Imagine the courage over those years, over those years. Uh, and so it wasn't that. So whatever it is that we want to try to do, we have to fight, march, just, it, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. It, it's just inconceivable to some people that it will. And as I always say, we have to shorten the distance between the inevitable to us and the inconceivable to them. It's about time, <laughs> and it is about time. But, but it is, uh, you know, it goes right to the roots of our country. These beautiful documents, our founding documents, thank God they made, made them amendable. But we aren't finished yet. And I'll talk more when you ask me about how I think we go from here in terms of unleashing the power of women in our country. You know, that's actually a perfect segue because at the Center for American Women in Politics, we're launching a new initiative, Teach a Girl to Lead. And it's yeah. all about trying to make women's political leadership and women's political history visible because so many of those women that you mentioned are not in the history books that our kids read. Um, and I'm just wondering if when you think about your own legacy, 
what do you want these girls and young women to see and to know and to learn in order to shape their own leadership careers as they move forward? Well, I, I'm sort of uh, uh, accidental in some ways. I never was going to run for office. I was raised in a political family. When I was born, my father was in Congress. When I was in first grade, he became mayor. When I went away to college, he was still the mayor of Baltimore. And so when I read books saying I wanted to be in politics since I was six years old, I did not. I want to be a teenager, and then I wanted to be, you know, a 50s teenager, rock around the college. That was where I was coming from. And I mean, my, our parents instilled in us six boys, one girl. Uh, I was raised with five brothers because one passed away. But instilled in us that public service was a noble calling, that we all had a responsibility to the community. And you didn't have to run for office to honor that. You could be a teacher. You could you, you just be active in the community, find your issue, find your passion, and uh, be ready for the opportunity that, was th that might present itself. Not in my case to run for office, because I was very shy, and I, I was a behind-the-scenes kind of person. But then the opportunity came along. And so I would say, as I say in, in my book, know your power. Whatever it is that you have done, whatever inspires you, whatever your passion is, whatever it is, rate it high. And it's like, in my case, I went from housewife to house speaker. Uh, <laughs> and some road in between. But I mean, how do you go from uh, uh, you know, the kitchen to the Congress? Well, there are opportunities that present themselves. And don't ever count out moms who are here the time that you were at home as sort of a blank. That's a gold star. That's a gold star. <laughs> count that. But it is, I mean, it's so urgent that young women, and when I say young, I mean any age. In other words, I always take off about 12 years of my uh, career and saying, <clears throat> I was doing the really important thing. I was raising my five children, uh, and, and uh, that taught me a lot about interpersonal relations, diplomacy, <clears throat> plotting, planning, scheduling, and the rest. But apart from that, it taught me this, and this is my driving force. People say, why do you do this? My kids are so great. My grandchildren are so bad. They have everything you know, in terms of opportunity, most importantly, love attention, mentoring, and the rest. And it just is intolerable to me that one in five children in America lives in poverty, that they frequently don't have food to eat at the end of the day, certainly the end of the month. And that as far as mentoring and reading to children at night, their moms have two jobs, their dads too. They don't have time to focus on those children. So when they ask me the three most important issues facing the Congress, I always say the same thing. Our children, our children, our children. Their health, their education, the economic security of their families. Healthy neighborhoods in which they can uh, grow and a world at peace in which they can thrive and make their contribution. But you can't have it, uh, uh, such low minimum wage, all those kinds of things without it taking a toll on the children, whether it's their housing, their security, in any way. So <clears throat> that's what the one in five, my kids know it, because I love them so much, I don't want them to be raised in a country where they have and others have not. It's just not, this is not right. It's not what our country is. And that's why it all comes together what, about what we're talking about today. And that is, excuse me, one second, the empowerment of women. We have been going around, I've probably been, I don't know, scores, over 50, but many more where I'm not, uh, initiatives. When women succeed, America succeeds. And when women succeed, <coughs> and when women succeed New Jersey succeeds. And here's how specific it is. We listened for a long time to what would make the biggest difference to women in the workplace? This is all about women and the workplace. It's not the Violence Against Women Act. It's not the Affordable Care. Those things we address in their place. 
but women in the workplace. And what women told us all over the country is the three things that would enable them to do more for themselves and their families and their careers were the following, the three pillars. One, pay equity, equal pay for equal work. And two, that same, that same pillar, raise the minimum wage. Over 60% of the people who receive the minimum wage are women, and they're not teenagers. Average age in early 30s, like that. Raise the minimum wage. Pay equity. In another couple of weeks, women who make around the country averages out about 77 cents on the dollar of what men make. So that means you've worked, we've worked the first three months of the year for free, right? For free. Is, is anybody think that's a good idea? For your mother, your sister, your daughter, your, your wife? So in April, I think it's like April 8th is the first day women will be getting paid who are in a situation where they work the same job, same qualifications, experience, education as their male counterpart, but they make 77 cents. So we have the bill to raise the minimum wage. We've done it before. We'll do it again. We have the bill, Paycheck Fairness Act, and that's prong one of, uh, 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 the, um, one of the legs of the stool. The second one is, and I congratulate New Jersey because you're in the lead in the country, is paid sick leave. You can't even hear, imagine the stories we hear about around the country of moms who have to put their child on a bus sick to go to school because they have no option. They can't take off work because they can't afford to be docked. Even if they did, they can't do it too often or else they won't have a job. They can't afford child care and they have no sick days that they can use for this. It's absolutely essential to strengthen our families. And it's for dads too. It's for dads too. And then the third piece is quality, affordable child care. Children learning, parents earning. And this is something that our founders, the women, the suffragettes, they worked hard to get, to, they worked very hard uh, to get women to have the right to vote. Didn't happen until into the 20th century, 90 some years ago. But then World War II, women in the workplace, out of the home, revolutionary. Revolution, Rosie the Riveter, revolutionary. This was remarkable. And then the higher education of women, women in the professions, or women at home, or women in entry level jobs, whatever their path was. But the missing link in all of that was childcare. So how can, how, when, when, you, when women go to work, and I know dads share this concern, but by and large, when women go to work, and so many single moms out there, they have to be where they are, not worrying about if their child is being neglected someplace or that they don't have quality, affordable childcare, where they're learning, not babysitting in front of a TV, learning. I'll just tell you this one story. So um, one, we had an event at uh, Hunter College, women, when women succeed, America <coughs> succeed. And every time we have these events, all over the country, I had two last week, one in San Antonio, one in Houston, fabulous. But we have real people telling their stories. And this one woman got up and she said, single mom, five kids, the whole struggle, immigrant mom, the, every challenge you can imagine. But she said, now I just got a promotion at work and I'm so proud and I was able to do this because my children were in Head Start. And of course, there's more to affordable childcare than Head Start, but this was her story. So she said, but and I'm so confident now, because I have these kids, and I have this job, and I just got a promotion. And she said, but I was nervous about speaking in front of 500 women at Hunter College in Midtown in Manhattan. So I said to my kids, will you listen to my speech, and will you tell me what you think? So lined up, she gave the speech. At the end of the speech, <clears throat> her four-year-old, who, any questions? Four-year-old who is in Head Start, says, I just have one question, Mom. She said, well, what's that? And she said, who gave you permission to use my name in your speech? <laughs> <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> How about that? The confidence, the self-esteem. I just love that story because that's what it's about, is having kids just be proud of who they are. And, uh, and of course, everybody could identify with it. When I was asked to run for Congress, the um, I, I never intended to run for public office, and so 
It wasn't as if, oh gosh, this would be great. It was, well, let me see. So I went to my kids. Now I have five children in six years. The day I had my fifth child, I brought her home from the hospital that week. Our oldest was turning six, so five and six. So they're all close. So by now, four of them are in college. I have one home. And I said, I go to Alexandra. She's a filmmaker, and they heard from it. And she said, I say, Alexandra, mommy has this opportunity. I remember, I run for Congress. It doesn't matter to me. I've never aspired to that. <clears throat> but I'm being asked, and I, I promised that I would consider it, but it's really up to you. If you, <clears throat> if you I wish if it were one more year and you were in college, it would be an easier decision. So she, I said, so I, I love being here. Now, this means I'll be, home, I'll be away from home about three nights a week. She and my husband, my husband's a very good dad, and so he bonds with all of our children, but they're very close. And so from the bottom of my heart, with all the sincerity I could mess, I wanted her to know it didn't matter to me if she said, stay home with me, Mom. Instead, she looked at me and she said, Mother, but she knew I was in trouble. You know, Mother, get a life. <laughs> Now, I had never heard that expression before. This was 26 years ago. I had never heard that expression. Get a life. What teenage girl doesn't want her mother gone three nights a week? <laughs> so that was my <laughs> unleash. But I, getting back to these, these moms, if, if moms have the confidence uh, that they can do what they need to do for their children, just think when you're only working three months of the year and you're not getting paid what that means to you, what you can do for your family, what it does for your pension. It's all all of it connected. And also women entrepreneurs who want to start a business and be uh, employers as well as employees. They have to have the confidence that the kids are in good hands uh, if that's the path that they want to take. And I always say to women, whatever the path is that you take that works for you, that's the good path. Don't, don't compare it to anybody else. And by the way, these moms, these moms who are working these two jobs, as I said before, they have no time to mentor their children, to teach them, to read to them at night, and the rest. And many of them are single moms that we're talking about. And dads, too, who have to hold down two jobs. Because if you work full time, imagine a family of four, you work two full time, make the minimum wage, you're still below the poverty line. You cannot afford to put adequate food on the table. So we have to, you know, we have to recognize that while we want everyone uh, to reach his or her fulfillment, there's some lifting up we have to do. And by the way, all of it good for the economy because it injects demand into the economy, creates jobs, and takes us um, uh, to a more successful place as a country. When women succeed, America succeeds. OK, let's do it again. When women <laughs> succeed, America succeeds. When women succeed, New Jersey succeeds. <laughs> So, you know, when I think about your legacy, I actually think about the fact that you have made women's leadership visible mm -hmm. across this country in a way that it's never been seen before. And that you have really paved the path. Mm -hmm. You talk about you thought the woman president would come before mm -hmm. the woman speaker. I think that what you've done is broken that marble ceiling, marble. as you refer to it, but opened the door and paved the way for the first woman president. So what I want to ask you now is, just between us, <laughs> is 2016 the year? Absolutely. <laughs> As I said, I, I never thought in the House, because it's over 200 years of a pecking order of people just, I had it, then you had it, and passing it down, and, that, and then we came in and said, wait a minute, and they said, who said she could run? Imagine that they would say such a thing <laughs> for babies. <laughs> Who said she could run? And then they said, why don't you make a list of all the things that you would like to have done differently around here, and we'll do those. But you know, really, what a silly comment to make. <laughs> but in any event, we got over that. And uh, I have to know that the American people are ready to elect a woman president. And you know what? Hillary Clinton will go into the White House as one of the most qualified people to go into the White House, in, in, in addition to being a woman. You know, in addition to being a woman. So if, if, you, if you wanted to create a path of, 
of uh, service on the Armed Services Committee, a diplomat of the highest standing and respected in our country, knowledge of so many of the issues, commitment to family, 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 children, 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 um, and really seeing it all from the vantage point of First Lady, really important, but in her own, and that was in her own right too, but further in her own right as the United States Senator. She knows the legislative branch, she knows the executive branch, she knows the, the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting thing. So we just have to uh, wait till we get through this election, which some of us are focusing on, and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, it'll be exciting. Imagine, well, imagine the message that Barack Obama's can, uh, presidency sent to the world the world, Africa, a black president of the United States. A couple of nights ago, we, Democrats met in New York, and we, at the end of the day, we went to see something called All the Way. It's a, a play about uh, Lyndon Johnson. It's got one subject, passage of the Civil Rights Act. When you see that that was just, for some of us, not most of you in this room, but for some of us, that was in our lifetime, and the attitude that people had and now we have a black president 50 years later. Now, that doesn't sound, that sounds like a long time, but really, really something quite remarkable. And so when Hillary Clinton hopefully makes her announcement about her running, it's going to change a lot of things. I mean, right now, little boys ask their moms, little boys who have moms who are members of Congress, can men be members of Congress too? <laughs> I didn't know you could have a male speaker, you know, that you get that. In our city, we, in California, we have so many women elected officials, Lots. they say, can men's, men be mayor too? That's a good thing. <laughs> but but uh, just think, and she'll be, she'll be so great. And the, the, um, just the boost of morale uh, to the world that we knock down another obstacle. And then for every young girl, every place, the sky's the limit. All things Let's are possible then. Yeah, things are possible. Well, I'm going to stop my questions because I know there are people in this room who are dying to ask you a question. Um, and we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to ask people not to make long statements, but to actually ask a question. Um, and that goes for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to cut you off. Um, so if you, if you have a question, raise your hand. Our staff is in the audience <clears throat> with uh, microphones. But I am going to just reveal something. I'm going to be biased. I'm going to go for student questions first. So um, I don't know. Oh, Crystal, you have a question. Crystal. Thank you, Leader Pelosi. It's such an honor. Um, my name is Crystal Devines. I'm a graduate fellow with the Eagleton Institute of Politics. So as you mentioned, when you first came to Congress, there were about 25 women. Um, now we have 100. And although that is better, still below 20%. I just would like to know what strategies would you recommend to get more women to run for political office? Well, I thank you, Crystal, for your question. And let me just say that New Jersey has sent what Millicent Fenwick, Marge Rockema. I did serve with Marge. She was wonderful. Uh, we really worked a lot more together then. Uh, uh, Amy Belgard is running uh, uh, in, in this election. I know you have many good candidates in the Rush Holt seat. Uh, so we want to see more uh, women coming from New Jersey. So you, you can suggest how we can do that from, from here. But as I said to you before, reduce the role of money, increase the level of civility. It, let women know their power. That Don't let anybody tell you, because you don't wear a suit and tie and all the rest, that you don't know the secret sauce. You got your own sauce. And, and that you just, you just go there. Now, here's what I would say. I have a DARE that I put out there on the money front. D-A-R-E, an acronym. D, disclose, where does big money come from? I've had like $100 million spent against me deciding how they would define me. So when I say to women, please run, they said, do you think I could put my family through what they put you through? And I said, it doesn't bother me because it's about something bigger. But disclose, where's this money coming from that's coming after, they really go after women candidates. Amend the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. We well. have to do that. <laughs> reform, reform, the, uh, we, we have a bill that will, uh, uh, it's a reform bill, citizen funding of elections, which honors small 
donors' participation. That will be very helpful to me. And empower, disclose, amend, reform, empower. Uh, make sure that the vote, people have the right to vote, that you remove obstacles of participation, and that votes are count, counted as cast. And one important uh, obstacle to voting is big, undisclosed money confusing the issues. So, so that's my plan, and we intend to do it. Unfortunately, we have to raise money in order to win, in order to reduce the role of money, but that's the path we're on. So that, and then increasing the level of civility. I mean, people, my father used to always say, he who, he who throweth mud loseth ground. And it really is true. It, you lose ground for the whole process. People throw mud, you know, what they perceive to be as the political process, all this negativism, and then they think, well, why don't you respect government? What you just saw that wasn't so great in a campaign. But what I, to get right down to the heart of woman to woman on all of this. It's a standard for leadership for anybody, but uh, I think women undervalue what they bring to the table. That's what I said, know your power. So what is it that drives you? If you decide you want to be involved in the public sector, that you may even want to put yourself on the line. By the way, this is not for the faint of heart. This is not for the faint of heart. So if your friend says she is going to run, join hands, join ranks. Men and women, for both. Okay. So what is your passion? What is your vision? Why? What draws you to this? It could be just, a, not just, but the more universal, the greatness of America, and, and, and I want to play my role in that, community role in that. Or it could be something very specific. It could be, as in my case, about children. It could be, in the case of my, some of my friends, about the environment. It could be a, a foreign policy, human rights, whatever your passion is. By the way, you're going to be expanding that because you have many more responsibilities. But whatever drives your engine, follow your passion on it. And when you get involved with like-minded folks who care about these things, and they see that you know and care, then they will um, respect that. Be, don't, so what is your vision? What do you know about this subject? Be knowledgeable. Be knowledgeable. Just make it your own. So that when you express an opinion, people know that you have good judgment and they're likely to follow your lead. Your vision, your knowledge and judgment. What plan do you have? Do you, do you see something going on? You think, I think I could do that better, or I think this could be done better. Think in a strategic way. How could I accomplish something? So people will watch me and say, that's an, an effective person who can get a job done and manage the issue. And if you have this vision and passion, you have this knowledge and judgment, and you have strategic thinking, and, and you have a plan. You have a plan. We all love to be dreamers, but a dreamer with a plan. I promise you, you will attract people to you when you tell them why and how, and they will know that you are a person who can get it done. But it, it does, and, and, and I always just say this one practical thing, don't overpromise. In other words, if, if, if you get involved at the grassroots level in politics, and that's really in Cal, you know, I, I, I moved to, my husband's a San Franciscan, so I was far away from Baltimore. I got involved in grassroots politics, one thing and another. But just say what you think you can do. I can bring 25 people to an event. I can stuff a zillion envelopes. People do that anymore, some do. Uh, whatever it happens to be, whatever piece of that initiative, whether it's an event for an incoming person that you're welcoming, that you produced what you said you were going to do, that you could be relied upon. And so you get an ever-widening circle of respect as an organizer, as a thinker, as a planner, and it's, it's really pretty exciting. And, and sometimes it, it will be for you, and sometimes you'll want to use that for somebody else. But you will command respect. And again, when you go into the arena, because you're going into the ring if you run for office, you know, somebody's bound to throw a punch at you, and sometimes you have to be ready to throw a punch too. 
we don't want to start there. I say we start with a feather, and we'll see <laughs> where we go from there. But it's, it's, a, it's the most exciting thing. And again, if it's about health care, it's about scientific research, it's about women in small business, whatever it happens to be, there's a subject to be um, the command of the matter and the uh, knowledge that you have about how it can be done better. I really do believe in women's intuition. It's, it's, you, some of you might, don't even know what I'm talking about. But in old days, they used to talk about women's intuition. And I really do think that it's a real thing. And women can make quick judgments because that's what we have to do if you're raising a family or helping your parents or something like that. So again, know your power. Be ready. I don't know, call you up. How about running for the? Be ready. And be ready just means respect all that you bring to the table. When you take inventory, give yourself high marks. I think we have one back there, Randy, right? Can you also say, stand up and tell us who you are? Okay. okay. I'm a student. Um, yep. My name is uh, Chantal Diaz. Um, I'm a student in Bloomfield High School. And I just want to say I'm very honored to hear you speak today of your achievements. And I just have a question. Uh, do you think that your achievement, achievements best um, uh, show women's progress in today's society? Or is it a call for action for uh, further advancement outside of politics and party principle for women? I would say both. And I thank you for your question. And you are the future. So this is what all of this is about. Uh, I would say it is, it, it is both. I, I have to take very special pride in the work that the women in Congress did uh, on the Affordable Care Act and that we just would not take no for an answer. And that's, and, we, um, and, and so that, that was really important to us. But if, if the, the lesson is really, if you, people know you're going to go away, then you won't have any success at all. But as long as they know. In fact, I, I'll tell you this story, that just because it translates to your second question, I think. Uh, when we were doing the Affordable Care Act, President Barty, the press said to me, some days it didn't look so, you know, just not happen. And I, they came to me and they said, you know what? You seem to be the only person who keeps saying we're going to pass this bill. I said, well, that's not true, but I am one of the people who are saying that. They said, well, how do you expect to do this? You got this one happening, you lost in Massachusetts, you know, all these kinds of things. I said, here's the thing. We have an opportunity to establish a pillar of economic and health security for the American people. It's a pillar that stands there with Social Security and with Medicare, and now health care for all is a right, not a privilege for the few. And we're not going to miss this opportunity. So when you talk about how we're going to get it done, we're going to go up to the, any obstacle that's in our way. We're going to go up to the gate, and we're going to push open the gate. The gate doesn't open. We're going to climb the fence. If the fence is too high, we're going to pole vault in. And if that doesn't work, we're going to helicopter in. But we're not letting anything stand in the way of affordable health care for all Americans. <laughs> so when it was finished, when it was finished, uh, when we did it, they said, well, which one did you do? <laughs> so we actually pushed open the gate. We pushed open the gate. We had the members who were so committed, and we had so many people in the community. We had the nuns. Thank God we had the nuns. <laughs> we had so many people in the community who cared, who helped in every possible way, help push open that gate. And for us, it wasn't just about the Affordable Care Act. It was about another manifestation of freedom and opportunity for the American people. And so when we talk about, is it just about, it's not about politics at all for us. It's about America. Uh, two words that I would say uh, uh, demonstrate what the president is about are freedom and opportunity. Freedom certainly are political freedoms. But to think of this as the Affordable Care Act, our founders, Right here in this state, in the 13 original counties, they came together, they fought, they sacrificed, in their words, their lives, their liberty, their sacred honor, 
for a country where people would have life, the, the declaration, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And that bill to us was about a healthier life, the liberty, the freedom to pursue your happiness, whatever that might be. You might be an artist, or you might be a small businesswoman, or you might be, so you, had, you could take your health care with you. You could take it to another job, to your own business, to, to being self-employed, to, to changing jobs. So that's, that was about freedom, and it was as, as connected to our founders as, as anything in our view. Also about freedom were some of the things that we did. We, when we did the, um, don't ask, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell. That was about fairness in the military, but it was about freedom for people. So we always wanted to expand freedom. We didn't see that in any way as partisan. And quite frankly, the obstacle to, to a lot of participation now, of course, is money. And those founders sacrificed all that they did for a democracy, a government of the many, not a government of the money. And so we have to keep making the fight from before. And one of the most wholesome aspects of it will be when women decide in bigger numbers that they want to participate in every aspect of our economy, of our society, of our culture, in a way of taking leadership, taking responsibility. And the center has been such a force for just saying, you can do it. And what you might want us to help you fill in the blanks on just how and, and the rest of that, it is there. So I thank you for your patriotic actions. Thank you. <laughs> making. I'm, we have time, I think, for just one more question. Two. So two. I, I have two. You want two? two? Okay, she wants two. two. So why don't the two of you right there, but if you can walk to this aisle so that that way we don't have the transition moment. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here, Leader Pelosi. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kathy Weininger. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Kathy Weininger. I'm a graduate student in the political science department. Um, I was curious about what you think of the Republican Women's Policy Committee um, and their formation, and how, what you think that adds or changes to this discussion about women's rights or women's issues. I'll be very honest with you. I'm not very familiar with the specifics of it, but I'm happy anytime sooner or later, that people come around to having a women's policy committee. And so I certainly look forward to working in a nonpartisan way, in a bipartisan way, with them on it. As I mentioned earlier, I served with Marge Rockamar, who was just a fabulous member from New Jersey. And uh, uh, it was all about what we're going to do for America's families. It wasn't about Republican, Democrat, or anything like that. So I welcome it, but I can't speak to the particulars of it. Perhaps you know more about it than I do about what it's about. No, yeah, I haven't seen it either. And this is going to be the last question. I'm also a graduate student in political science. Um, my question was, I was wondering how it was being in such a male-dominated environment for so long, and I wondered whether you ever felt a pressure to change your behavior to kind of imitate the men in Congress more often, and if you've had to fight against that. I love your question. I love your question. <laughs> it enables me to tell you another story. <laughs> so see this whole room? Just imagine. 20 people being women and all the rest being men. It's just, what? <laughs> what is this? And uh, in the beginning, that we were sort of, it didn't matter to them because we were so few and the rest. And then our numbers grew, and then, my goodness, who told her she could run? So <laughs> it was different. You see, I guess what I said earlier was I, I grew up in a family of five older brothers, sports, you know, all that stuff. And um, I, it, it didn't, for me, I'm just talking about me. For me, I didn't, I never, you know, sometimes you think people change their voice when the men come in the room or something like that. Our women didn't do that. <laughs> they were there, imagine what it took to get there at, in those days to Congress. So nobody was going to um, imitate them, you know. 
But here's the thing that was really funny. They really, bless their hearts, have changed a lot. The, <laughs> when we were there, right in the beginning, we used to have a dinner group that would go to dinner. On, it was called Tuesday night, but it could be any night that we would go to dinner. And Barbara Kennelly, I know I have a friend here from Trinity College, or we both went to school. Barbara Kennelly, she went to Trinity College, as did I. And Barbara Boxer and I were three of the women in this group of like a dozen or so who would go to dinner. Uh, it, it, it's no offense to women. It, it's one of those situations where everybody just talks at the same time, and it was not, if you want to talk, you just chime in, and, and, and that's it. But they never would say to us, what do you think? Now, it, would, it would be like so impossible for them to do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? And then one night, they uh, started talking about when their wives gave birth. And we thought, do you want to talk about this over dinner? <laughs> but they didn't ask us what we thought <laughs> about that. But they went on, and we, we sat there, the three of us. Now, I have Barbara Boxer has two children. Barbara Canelli has four, and I have five. So we have 11 children among the three of us. <laughs> and they went on. Oh, you should have seen it. When I went, I, I had this green, the green thing, the mask. And I wanted to take my camera in, and they said, no, you can't bring your camera. Well, I could go for the first, couldn't go for the first child, but I could go for the second child. Oh, I took pictures, and I have them if you want to see them. They're going on and on about how it was for them the night they gave birth. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, what would you know? What do you know? I mean, get out of here. And so, so we thought, for sure, somebody might say, even, does this bother you that we're talking? <laughs> You know, who really delivers, right? <laughs> Literally and figuratively. Nothing. 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 And we were like, really, this is ridiculous. But, so a week later, we're having our dinner again. And one of this beautiful man, Don Edwards, who, uh, he was the floor leader for the ERA, a beautiful California legislator. It, just master of the constitutional. We were talking about a subject, and he turned to me and he said, and to us, the women, and he said, "What do you think?" And we said, "Oh my God, da, 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 last week this, that, 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 that." And the others who were at the table, because he wasn't there the week before, I said, "Thank you so much for asking us what we think. You believe that they didn't even ask us what we thought about childbirth that we might know more." <laughs> and the guys, the, the guys, they said, "That never happened." We never would have done that to you. And I said, you know, really, I don't know if it was worse when you were doing it or whether you were so <laughs> clueless about it. But we thought, this is really instructive. If, they're not, if they think they know more about the night the baby was born, <laughs> then we really just have to assert ourselves in every other area as well. <laughs> so, but, um, but I I, I, if I just may, um, Debbie, once again, thank you uh, for all that you, have, that you are doing, uh, Ruth, all, all of you, to Jackie, to President Barfi. He was so wonderful to be with us for this presentation. Thank you. I want to thank all of you who came today. I hope that when we tell some stories and, you know, just anecdotally, uh, what it's like to be there and what possibilities are. We're at a place where well, we can just break through. We can just break through. And one of the reasons is, is because of the center and the work that they have done. One of the reasons is because of our young people, the way boys are raised now, seeing their moms work or their sisters or this or that. They have a different attitude uh, in terms of women. But really, it comes down to girls, young girls, students, young women, and what they see in themselves. And I hope they see in themselves, I hope you see in yourselves, the best possible future. Because it, you, it, truly your success is important to you, but it's also important to our country. And it's a really thrilling thing. And think, think of those suffragettes and what they did. Think of the prospect of a woman president of the United States. And think of a possibility that after that it might not even be so unusual, a woman speaker, a woman, a woman a president, uh, because it is 
uh, about what our country is about. And, and, and going on now, because I'm so moved to see so many of you here, it gives me so much hope. You are our inspiration. You are our hope. And know your power. Go for it. Be ready. Thank you to the center many more than you Thank you. Thank you.